Boketov Kharim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And I'm starting on a project here, but I can't ever say when I'm going to get to the next step of this or how many parts there will be. Uh, and I still have made a promise to get with you guys on the Sabbath and how to keep the Sabbath. I, I mentioned that because we're going to go into the law. We're going to actually go into Levitical law. And I want to share with you how prophetic and, and how important the law is, things that you may not realize. Uh, so we'll be looking at the first three chapters of Leviticus, and I intend to continue to go deeper with you. But there again, can't say when the next time will be because I'm going as I feel led in the Lord to speak to you about these things. But I figure it might be a blessing for you. And I will get to the Sabbath, uh, the Ten Commandments. Maybe we should just do a video separately on the Ten Commandments, but... I've kind of not got to the Sabbath as of yet. How to keep the Sabbath mainly for those that desire to want to do that. Uh, the reason for this, though, is because I'm trying to get my wife synchronized with me to do it uh, because it's a blessing when you get to hear from both of us. And there's a lot of information she knows as well in the study of the Greek language. Uh, and I'll bring it from the Hebraic side. So we can bring both Old and New Testament together showing you uh, and the historical value of keeping God's commandments and how we should do that. So we'll get to that soon. But anyway, let's go, go straight to the book of Leviticus. <clears throat> and everything that I'm going to share with you here, I won't have to, we're not going to go into anything in the, in the Hebraic language because it's not a need to in this particular part. There are going to be other laws that we'll go into Hebrew so you can understand more of a significance. But uh, I'd like to start off and let's go with chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. We won't read every single verse. We'll skip through a little bit of it because there's certain things I want you to focus on. Uh, it says, And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, Say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. <clears throat> If, if his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. Uh, he shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Every, everything there is symbolic, as well as uh, uh, the natural act that had to be done. The, of course, the lamb without spot, no blemishes in it certainly shows that Christ, him being the Lamb of God, would have to be without spot, no blemish, could not be tainted with the, uh, with the ecumenical movement of his day, we might say. Uh, it's different, it's not, you know, it's more of a rabbinical movement of the different sects, Pharisees, Sadducees, etc., but he could not be tainted with any of this. He could not be tainted with sin. He had to be spotless, without blemishes. And you're to take that Lamb, that have, that those of you that have sinned, and you're of your own free will, showing that Christ, you take him freely. It's your choice to accept him as your sacrifice or not. And you offer him at the door of the tabernacle. Why? Because he is the door to the sheepfold. So, <clears throat> a lot of interesting things there. And he, sh and he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make an atonement for him. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priest and Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever had to lay your hands on the head of a lamb or a goat or a deer or whatever the case may be and take its life by cutting its throat. But it is the hardest thing you could ever possibly imagine. As you hold the animal with your hand and you place it upon his head and you take his life, knowing that his life is meant for yours. Now that's even in the natural. Because when you live by food, you're living because you're eating the flesh of something that has lost its life. That's both for vegetarians and for those that are non-vegetarians. Every time you eat, something must die so that you can live. 
That's in the spiritual as well as in the natural. We all live by dead substance. We all have to partake of something that once lived. If you eat an apple or if you eat a cucumber, it comes from a living plant. The corn, not only is the corn taken the years of the corn, but it is also cut down. Replanted. Yes, the apple tree, for example, will continue to live, but the apple that was on it, remember, the apple itself has life as well. Just like your teeth and your body are living organisms in your body. It's even said, like, for example, if you take into a root canal, you have killed the tooth. And the root canal then, at that point there, is packed in, and so many people have trouble because why? There's a dead tooth, a rotting, something that is wanting to decay, it's in your body. And so, like for example, so when the apple or the orange or whatever comes from the tree, it literally has life too, just like your teeth have life. And its life is separated, it is freely given its life so that you can live. The lamb is the same, or the cow, or anything else. But taking the life of a living creature and you happen to be to, to be partaker of that, it's very hard. I've done it. I know what it's like. I cried like a baby. In fact, when I did this one time, I wept and I said, God, this must have been like you when you were on the cross and you were blading your life leaving your body. I said, is this the way we should feel? when our hands are upon your head and we cry out to you as you're dying for us, for our own lives. Anyway, it's very heart moving for me in, in this regard. He says, and he shall kill, verse five, and he shall kill the bullock before the Lord and the priest and Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood around about uh, the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle in the congregation. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. Then the sons of Aaron and the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And the priest and Aaron's sons shall lay the parts, the head and the fat in order upon the wood. Uh, that is on the fire which is upon the altar, but his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice and an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. You know, I've always wondered if the burning of the sacrifice is, is the, is, it's, <clears throat> you know, the animal is going up, it, you're changing the entire makeup of the animal, animal at that point there. His body is literally going up back into gas uh, and, and, and to uh, smoke and things that is going up before the Lord. And I think of that as being like when Christ left his body, you know, his spirit ascended up. You know, so I've always kind of wondered the, the, the analogy of the two. Uh, but this is the point that I wanted to bring in Leviticus 1. Very interesting. Verse 10. And if his offering be of the flock, namely of the sheep or of the goats... Notice the sheep or the goats. Christ is represented both ways. He's the scapegoat. He is the sacrificial goat. And he's also the lamb of God. He's everywhere you see he's there. <clears throat> uh, you shall bring a, bring a male without blemish. And he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord. And the priest and Aaron's son shall sprinkle his blood round about upon the altar. Very interesting. The blood is sprinkled around, but he's to be killed on the north side of the altar. Do you realize that when Yeshua was killed, he was killed north of the altar, right there on the very mountain, just above the, the, uh, uh, the, the where a Palestinian bus station is today. It's called Golgotha. If you've ever gone to the... the, 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 the um, if you've ever been to the to the tomb there, it was called the Garden Tomb, where they believe is maybe the place where Yeshua was buried. It was a huge, beautiful vineyard there. It was a it was a a, a, a a grape vineyard, and there was a wine press there. Everything, 
and uh, which is another significant thing in itself. The very fact that there was a wine press, he was squeezed, his life was squeezed from him, that it could bring forth eternal life. Uh, it represents the wine, represents the, the revelation, and, and how that this, the older it is, the stronger it gets. So the, the longer it's been since Yeshua was here, the greater the revelations he's pouring out in the latter days. Um, we, we, we see the fact that he's on Golgotha, the place of a skull, and you can clearly see in the mountain, especially years ago, you can see it even better as over time it begins to wear away, but you see the skull face in the side of the mountain. This is where a query where Solomon had used to, to bring rocks and stuff, or either Hezekiah, one, I forget which one, to make the, uh, the temple, the stones of the temple. I believe it was Hezekiah that did that. And... Um, but there is where he was crucified at. The blood was sprinkled around the altar. See, showing even, even as Israel would be scattered to the four corners of the world, all over the earth, they would steal. They cried out, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And so therefore, what they meant derogatory, God applied as mercy to them. So his blood was to be sprinkled all around the altar. And uh, so, very interesting to, to say the least. But anyway, let's go ahead and read. And he shall cut it in, in the pieces in his head and his uh, fat, and the priest shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar. But the legs, <clears throat> uh, uh, excuse me, verse 14, and if the burnt sacrifice for, for his offering to the Lord be of the, f excuse me, I'm sorry, back up to, no, nope, no, nope, I'm sorry. For, for the burnt sacrifice of the offering is the Lord to be of the fowls. Then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or young pigeons, and the priest shall bring it unto the altar and wring off his head and burn it on the altar, and the blood thereof shall be uh, shall be wrung out at the side of the altar. And this is when you're bringing up a pigeon or a dove. Remember how that when Yeshua was being baptized. The Spirit of God descended in the form of a dove. In other words, it was like the, like the, um, um, the Holy Spirit, the amber fire. The Spirit of God came down. It was like an, maybe an amber fire, we might think, because we know the Scripture speaks about He's a burning light and speaks of the, amber color, of the color amber. So no doubt God comes in the form of a dove when He comes and rests upon Yeshua there at His baptismal. And so, but anyway, so when this offering is made, whether it be a, uh, uh, when you're bringing a dove, a turtle doves, or young pigeons, and the priest shall bring it unto the altar, and wring off his head, and burn it on the altar, and the blood thereof shall be wrung out at the side of the altar. Notice verse 16, though. And he shall pluck away his crop with his feathers, and cast it beside the altar on the east part by the place of the ashes. Why would he put the feathers, the wings? The wings are what, the feathers from, from his wings are all being placed on the east side of the altar. Even, even he sh shall cleave it with the wings thereof, but shall not divide it asunder. But those feathers, that were part of his wings, are put on the east side. You know, the Bible says, in the way that you've seen the, the Son of Man go, the same way he shall come back. He shall enter in at the eastern gate. And he didn't just... Uh, walk away, he flew away. So as he comes back, coming through the air, he comes to the eastern gate, showing that the wings, the wings of the dove, the wings of the eagle, returns back on the eastern side. That's chapter one of Leviticus and the Levitical law. And uh, I wanna take you into chapter two, but we're gonna go down a, a bit here. Let me just first read the first two verses though to set the stage for it. And when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, now that's like flour, cakes, uh, things of that nature there. Uh, it's, you know, the, the, those are your meat offerings. Uh, the shall be a fine flour and shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon. Now oil represents the spirit, okay? Frankincense, he was anointed. Notice how him being the bread of life when he was here, he was that bread. And he was filled with the Spirit of God, the oil and the frankincense. What did, what did Mary Magdalene do? She anointed him with the most expensive oil there was, frankincense. They brought him the, the precious ointments and things at his birth. Everything types him. 
Um, and he shall bring it uh, to Aaron's son and the priests, and he shall take their uh, uh, his hand. Excuse me. He shall take there out his handful of the flour thereof, of the oil thereof, and with the frankincense thereof. And the priest shall burn burn the memorial of it upon the altar. Uh, to be an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. God knowing his only son would come and that his son would type out every bit of it. See, this is letting him know. This, this is putting it in God's mind, knowing what he's going to do and knowing what his son will suffer. Very interesting. Let's move down to verse 9. And the priest shall take from the meat offering a memorial thereof, and shall burn it upon the altar. It is an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. And that which is left of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons, and the things most holy of the offering of the Lord made by fire. No meat offering, watch this one, which you shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven. No sin will be any. For you shall burn no leaven, nor any honey. Isn't that interesting? No, not only leaven, but not even honey is to be offered up. It's because his life would not be sweet. His life would be bitter. Although he is sweet to us, and we love him dearly. Remember when the prophet taken the book in the Old Testament and God tell her, actually, I believe, um, maybe that was John. I forget now which prophet that was. But he said to eat the book. It'll be sweet like honey in your mouth, but it'll be bitter in your belly. Christ came. And the life he had to suffer for us was bitter. And any offering of the Lord made by fire... And for the oblation of the first fruits, you shall offer them unto the Lord, but they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. And every oblation of thy meat offering shall thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offerings. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt, because he is the salt of the earth. Just incredible. And if thou offering a meat offering of thy first fruits unto the Lord, thou shalt offer the meat offering of thy first fruits green ears of corn. Now this is another one that just blows you away. Green ears of corn dried by fire, even corn beaten out, beaten out of full ears. And thou shalt put oil upon it and lay frankincense thereon as a meat offering. Corn dried by the fire, beaten out. Do you realize that this would show what Yeshua would go through, that he would be beaten in order to bring forth that kernel of life, in order for that, that life-giving source to bring forth that life? He would have to be beaten. Everything everything that we go through in our ritual customs that were given to us as the Jewish people in the laws throughout the Torah speak of him. The priest shall burn the memorial of it, part of the beaten corn thereof and part of the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Going into chapter 3 now. And if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, he shall offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. So, at, at any rate there, um, let me take you over... Just, just an ending. We, go, we still continue into the offerings of the sacrifices of the blood uh, that's being offered throughout chapter 3. But I want to just show the, con the, the, the conclusion of chapter 3 because it's where we'll stop at for now. And it basically just shows how that this is to be carried out as far as timing. 
Um, it gets into the kidneys and the two kidneys, uh, the fat that is upon them, which is of the flanks and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall be take, take away. Then the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire for a sweet savor. All the fat is the Lord's. It's like most people, they like eating the fat off of a steak. For the children of Israel, we were never allowed to do this. It belongs to him. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire for a sweet savor. All the fat is the Lord's, but excuse me, it shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings in that you eat neither fat nor blood. Jews didn't have it easy. That's one thing for sure. So, but you know, from our hearts, from our hearts, we keep his word. I had to take and come back with you for just a moment or two longer here, and it was regarding in Leviticus, uh, the first chapter, when we were reading earlier about um, when, the, when the sacrifice was being parted, and it says, shall lay the parts, uh, the head and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire, which is upon the altar, verse 8 that is. Now verse 9, listen to this one carefully. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash and water. And the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice and offering made by fire a sweet savor unto the Lord. I did not know at the time what the significance was of the washing of the legs. And then it come to me as I was putting the video together for you, which is something I'm doing right now. Washing of the legs. His feet were to be washed. In Hebrew, the word uh, for legs uh, applies to the feet as well. It's just one single Hebrew word. And that's what the woman did when he was invited to Simon's house. Yeshua clearly said, you gave me no kiss. You did not wash my feet. Isn't it interesting? Rechel is the Hebrew word for feet. Reglin. His feet, his legs, in other words, like from like the knee down to his feet, all the same thing. They were not washed. And in the sacrifice, it was already written in the Torah. They should have known to wash his feet, to wash his legs. Because he was the Lamb of God that would be offered up as a sacrifice. I trust that's a blessing for you. It was definitely a blessing for me. If you uh, are... Feels, feeling your heart to want to support this ministry, we certainly thank you for that. We thank you for those that, of you that are supporting this ministry. We desperately do need your help. Be coming to the United States in mid-June. We are working with Sister Lisa Tesh, the one we had with the prayer with earlier, of putting together a meeting uh, that would be in Newport Ritchie, Florida. So if you want to be a part of that as well, email us at stephenbenoon at aol.com. We'll update you with the information that uh, about that. Uh, I'll also be speaking in Israel at a conference there uh, that Brother uh, Kellen Davison, who writes for us on Israeli News Live, uh, that he's putting to together. He's also the, the editor and founder of David Star Magazine. Uh, there'll be a number of speakers there that'll be on the, I think, the 20th through the 22nd of September. So if you'd like to meet us in Israel at a particular conference that we'll be a part of, we'll definitely be there as well. You can meet us there. But we'll be in the United States for about a month uh, to, to meet with you guys, take care of personal business as well, uh, and then back home. So uh, we thank you. Thank you for your support and your love for this ministry. And uh, if you want to give, you can give online our websites, israelinewslive.org or israelreturns.com, either place as well as uh, our address, which is located on our website under contact. You can mail, uh, if you prefer to mail uh, an offering as well. God bless you and thank you. Shalom.